All righty. There's a lot going on today. There's, of course, the ongoing uh, tragedy in Eastern Europe, which um, at any point could uh, start burning out of control and engulf the entire planet. There's also this situation uh, up in Memphis uh, where this um, um, motorist was beaten to death by, you know, Rodney King style uh, by uh, five cops. And we have more details coming out about one of the uh, one of the dead January 6th protesters who also appears to have been beaten to death by the cops. And we have footage now of the um, incident at the Pelosi home in which Nancy Pelosi's um, octogenarian husband, Paul Pelosi, was uh, nearly beaten to death by an illegal immigrant with a hammer. So there's a lot of beatings in the news right now. And honestly, I don't think I could pick any one of them uh, to talk about. I don't think that I could narrow it down to just one of them. And I don't want to spend three hours here, um, or maybe more realistically like an hour and a half, if I really you know, put my mind and in, 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 in addressed each one of them individually. So I'm going to try and do a brief overview. Um, I guess I'll start with the Paul Pelosi footage. That, I think, is the most uh, jarring from a visual standpoint. We finally got the body cam footage. I don't know why they withheld it so long, but I will give them uh, the authorities' props for finally releasing it. And I have to say that I am more inclined to believe the official narrative after having seen the, the body cam footage than I was inclined to believe it before when they were hiding it. Now, there's a lot of people making a big stink about this body cam footage, and what you see is Paul Pelosi opens the door, and he has an interesting expression on his face. People are describing him as calm and nonchalant. I don't think that that's accurate, um, and I'll, but I'll get into that. So he opens the door, and you can see his right hand is holding the head of the hammer up around the neck. Uh, of the hammer that is in David DePape's hand. And so David DePape is kind of standing right over Paul Pelosi's shoulder. And, um, you know, I think Paul says something like, hello, boys. And, uh, you know, the cops say, hey, is everything, go you know, what, what's going on here? And David DePape says, everything's just fine. And then they shine a light down and they see the hammer. They say, drop the hammer. And he's, you know, and he says, no, can do. And then he whips it out and he gets a real good swing and whacks Paul Pelosi upside the head, uh, which is... Uh, uncomfortable to watch. I don't like seeing uh, somebody beat an old man over the head with a hammer. It's, you know, it's, it's a scary situation. And so what I saw in Paul Pelosi's face was I, I thought he clearly uh, was under duress, but he was trying to act calm so as not to set off this obviously unstable individual. And by and if you dispute that he's obviously unstable, well, look at what ended up happening. He flew off the handle, literally, and uh, whacked him upside the head with the hammer. So Paul Pelosi, I think, was trying to act calm. I think he was trying to just keep the guy at bay because he knew that physically he could not overpower this guy who would, you know, on top of being armed with a hammer. He was uh, like half of Paul Pelosi's age, and he um, uh, looked physically bigger. So I th think it probably is a safe assumption to say that he had a greater muscle mass than 82-year-old or whatever it is, Paul Pelosi, who didn't look – I don't think you know, Pelosi looked too bad for being an, uh, an octogenarian alcoholic. You know, what, what a lot of people seem to be making a stink over is the fact that Pelosi had a drink in his hand. Well, for one thing, um, and that he was in his underwear, as someone who has known alcoholics – you know, more than one throughout my life, it's not unusual to find them at their, you know, at their home uh, in their underwear with a drink in their hand. In fact, alcoholics almost always have a drink in their hand, particularly if they're up late at night. And so if you want to believe the official narrative, which I didn't used to, but, you know, looking at the footage, how does it, how does it um, match up with the official narrative? Well, what we were told is that this David DePape guy broke into the house and essentially held Paul Pelosi at hammer point um, and told him, you know, hey, bring Nancy here. Um, we're going to wait for Nancy to get home or something like that. And 
if you're being held hostage uh, and you want to kind of act natural in your way, in, 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 for those of you who don't recall, Paul Pelosi claims that he was able to go to the bathroom and it was in there that he dialed 911 and said, hey, you know, being held hostage, you should probably send somebody over here uh, to help me. You know, Pelosi, if he's being held hostage, um, it's not unreasonable that the guy would have allowed him to pour a drink, especially if he's under that kind of stress. I mean, I could see him say, hey, even if he didn't already have a drink out uh, and poured, he would have said, hey, you know, mind if I pour a drink? And David DePape probably, you know, because David DePape doesn't think of himself as a bad guy. Um, he probably, you know, he, he's there waiting to, because he wanted to talk to Nancy Pelosi. So he's like, oh, fine, go ahead, you know, pour a scotch or something. And so Paul Pelosi is there trying to act natural uh, until the police arrive. So if, you know, Paul Pelosi's expecting the police, David DePape is not. And, uh, you know, so he, the alcoholic, um, you know, pours a glass to calm his nerves and he's holding that glass when he opens the door. And the way he was holding the hammer, clearly he was trying to restrain DePape uh, and, uh, you know, not help him or something like that. His hand, De, the, DePape had, was holding the, uh, the handle, of the, the hammer, the shaft or whatever, the wood part, uh, with two hands. And Pelosi was kind of grabbing up at the head of the hammer, you know, trying to keep it down. So my instinct when I see this video is not to say that Paul Pelosi was not a victim. Seemed to me like he was a victim and that uh, he was almost killed. So that might not be a popular take, but that's what I see. There might be other evidence that comes out that, you know, um, suggests something more nefarious. But, oh, excuse me, bumped into something. But as of right now, mm, I'm I'm not too... And frankly, even if it, even if the official narrative wasn't true, does it matter that much? You know, no. But it, you know, it's close enough for government work, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's not a hill I'm going to die on. I think that the story that they went with checks out well enough. So, uh, moving on to, I guess we'll do the police brutality stuff next. Um, not too familiar with this case of the uh, of the five cops beating the guy to death in Memphis. Um, does it shock me? Uh, no, I've never thought that I've never been a back the blue guy. I think that stuff like this, you know, it's perfectly possible. If, you know, I would think the police uh, commit crimes just like non-police do. Um, you know, there are plenty of murders in the world. And, uh, you know, sometimes those murderers happen to be police officers, especially since police officers, you know, have power over uh, civilians. And uh, a lot of times they're willing to abuse that in order to. Um, accomplish things that perhaps they wouldn't think that they were capable of getting uh, away with if they didn't have a badge. Now, these five cops involved were fired and apparently have been charged with uh, murder. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that as much as this is a national story, it's not a racial story because all five of the cops were black and the victim was black. Uh, kind of a common thing in Memphis. I don't think that there are um, still a lot of white folks palling around inner city Memphis. At least last time I was there, I didn't see them. And so it's interesting to me that this is a story at all um, because there is no racial angle to it. I really don't know what the media has to gain. Uh, I don't know what anyone involved has to gain. Um, you know, there are uh, examples of police brutality all the time. There are people who are straight up murdered by cops on camera and you can see the videos. I mean, you know, check any of these cop watch accounts if any of them still exist. Um, there's a, um, oh gosh, what was the website? Free Thought Project. I think they post all of the police brutality videos. Um, you know, there's plenty of them. So I don't understand what angle there is about this story um, that, you know, allowed, that it gave the media the go ahead. Okay, we're allowed to talk about this one. Uh, just kind of strange, you know, because, you know, then you move to a situation like Roseanne Boylan, um, who appears to have been beaten to death by the Capitol Police uh, on January 6th. And uh, obviously there's not going to be any outrage about that because she's an evil insurrectionist. And I don't know what Miss uh, Roseanne Boylan looked like, but, you know, in all likelihood, she probably was white. Uh, you know, let's be honest. But, you know, the fact that nobody is upset about her death and nobody's ever cared about it is kind of the norm um, for this, you know, for, you know, police brutality stuff. Most police brutality uh, goes unchallenged and 
um, you know, without much fanfare. Uh, I've seen enough of the videos, and I have to tell you, a small fraction of them become famous. A small fraction of them become, you know, George Floyd or Freddie Gray or, uh, um, uh, what's his name, Michael Brown, and now this, uh, I can't even remember this this new guy's name. But this new guy, again, it, can, it confuses me, because normally the common through line we have is white cop, uh, black um, black deceased. You know, whether or not you think they're a victim or not, it depends on the circumstances. They're not always victims. Um, and then uh, in Georgia, we had, you know, sort of uh, off-duty or retired cop, you know, making a citizen's arrest um, who was white and a, and a black guy who was killed. I don't remember the name of that case. Those guys, I think, uh, got the death penalty or at least life in prison. Um, and there were three of them, including the guy who videoed it. Um, which, I mean, that's just, that's just sickening to me to think about. I mean, what is that guy doing? You wouldn't have any evidence if it weren't for that guy. He videoed it and then showed it to the police, and so he got life in prison for that. You know, he's, convicted, he's a convicted murderer now. So just, it, it sickens me to think that the, the, the people that our system is willing to prosecute and the ones that they're not. It says, it says a lot. It says almost everything you need to know about America, frankly. Just look at the people who who are prosecuted and thrown away, you know, for life in prison or the death penalty, and the people who are. Sure, there's a lot of people um, who get harsh sentences who deserve it. There's a lot of people who uh, get harsh sentences that don't deserve it. And there's a lot of people who don't get any punishment at all who really deserve a really strict punishment. And it's not an accident. It's not like a rate of error. Um, it's not just like, oh, it just didn't work out. And so, you know, they accidentally put the wrong guy away or they accidentally let the, let the, let the bad guy go. That's not how it is. Now, what was the last thing I wanted to discuss today? Um, oh, it was the RNC chair. I'm, I can't believe, you know, on most days when I have like four topics I want to get to like this, I'm not able to get at them. I normally start talking about the first thing and then I go 15 minutes and then I go, bah, I'm not going to talk about everything else. You know, now I'm actually doing pretty good. I'm at 12 and a half minutes and I'm just starting the, uh, the RNC debacle. So for those of you who don't know, this just happened an hour or two ago. Rona Romney McDaniel has been reelected to a fourth term as uh, the chairwoman of the Republican National Committee. And so she is the longest serving uh, chairman or chairwoman uh, in all of the 21st or 20th centuries. So you have to go all the way back to the 19th century um, in which you know the Republican Party only existed for about half of that century, I believe, um, to find someone who was more entrenched and a longer lasting in their position, who just wouldn't give up the job. So, uh, Rona, which again, bad name in the era of COVID to have an RNC chair named Rona, just doesn't doesn't play well with you know with the crowds. Um, she won 111 votes, and then her next closest challenger had about half that, like 51, less than half that. So it was an absolute blowout. Now, obviously. Uh, as someone who is uh, not a fan of pretty much anyone who is currently in power anywhere, you know, I mean, just as a, um, as a general rule, if there's an incumbent, I don't support them. There are very few incumbents that I do support. You know, there's people like Thomas Massey. Um, you know, you got, uh, I would say Matt Gates now. I'd be happy reelecting Matt Gates. Uh, DeSantis now. Um, there are a few other people. Uh, Rand Paul. But for the most part, if you're an incumbent in your position, I oppose you. So that is true with this McDaniel woman. Um, the next closest challenger was a uh, California attorney named Harmie Dillon. I know that she is uh, somewhat associated with Robert Barnes. Barnes seems to think highly of her. Um, I don't know her personally. I don't know anyone who knows her personally. What I would say is that what I've seen of Dillon professionally, um, you know, in the public, things that she has done publicly, um, she seems to have a decent head on her shoulders. Um, her her pitch for being RNC chair, you know, generally made sense. Other than that, I can't tell you. You know, maybe once she actually got into the job, she could have turned into a dirt bag. Always possible, but hey, um, worth a shot when you know when you're guaranteed to know that Olorona, um, Mitt Romney's niece, 
you know, no matter how many times you reelect her, she's always going to be Mitt Romney's niece. And so what can I tell you for certain about Harmie Dillon? She's not Mitt Romney's niece. It's about the best thing I think that any that could be said about any woman. The only thing worse you could say about a woman is that, like, they were Mitt Romney's daughter. Now, something else that I noticed is that uh, yesterday, uh, DeSantis, governor of Florida, um, endorsed, well, kind of in a roundabout way, but he basically endorsed Harmeet Dillon over Rona Romney McDaniel, uh, which I think is an interesting move if he indeed, as so many people say, plans on running for president in 2024. You know, why would he want to, oh my gosh, why would you want to piss off the person who's going to be RNC chair? You know, that's, that's not going to be good for you, especially if you're if you're the upstart and you're trying to, you know, m muscle in on Donald Trump's territory. You know, you don't want to piss off old Rona because she could uh, stab Trump in the back on your behalf if you ingrati ingratiate yourself with her. You know, isn't that what we're told is DeSantis' strategy? He's going to cozy up to the donor class and uh, all the worst people in the GOP and say, hey, you know, I'm not Trump. You know, you guys hate Trump. Let's work together. But yet he gets involved in the RNC chair race, which, frankly, he wouldn't have to. Um, there's no reason why he has to publicly. I mean, nobody, most people have no idea, who, you know, what the RNC, that there is such a thing as an RNC chair. And so he went out of his way, certainly, to insert himself into this race and uh, endorse Harmony Dillon. The only thing that I can think, uh, as far as an explanation as to why you do that, um, is to ingratiate himself more with the base because it's only the people who are sort of the most plugged into politics you know on the gop side gop activists basically who would care about the rnc um uh, chairman race and so he endorsed sort of the the upstart outsider candidate uh, to lead the rnc and so while at the end of the day it doesn't matter since still lost um i do think that that is a good sign coming from DeSantis. He signaled something good to the audience by doing that. So um, that's kind of the only reason I wanted to bring up the RNC chair race was the DeSantis angle, because I do think that that makes this a bit more interesting. Um, but with that said, I will see you folks back here tomorrow.